accountable. Well, I want to thank everybody for your invitation uh, to be here. And what I'm going to be doing today is showing you some pictures from my latest railroad book. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with my earlier one, Railroads of Rhode Island. But in my retirement, uh, I decided to kind of put together uh, all of the adventures that I'd had on my travels around the, uh, the world, mostly by train. And uh, the subtitle of this uh, book is uh, 500,000 Miles by Rail. And so what I'm going to do is show you a series of pictures uh, that will try to explain how I happen to have the opportunity uh, to make all these trips uh, and uh, what I saw uh, on them. All right, now let me try to see if I can advance. Okay, so your screen should have gone blank. Yep. Okay, well, I think there's a reason why I've had all these chances. I come from a very unusual family background. My father was a doctor, his older brother was a doctor, his older brother was a doctor. Uh, there were three doctors in one family, and in the old country, Russia, they were all scholars. On the other hand, my mother, whose maiden name was Chase, <coughs> was the first one in her family ever to get a high school diploma. Uh, they were adventurers. You know, the first Chase came to the United States in 1640, and they kind of migrated all over the country. But by 1870, there was a big contingent of the family that was in Auburn, California, and they were gold miners. Uh, and uh, my mother and father met when she decided to take her high school diploma and use it to get in a nursing school. And mom and dad met in the delivery room of St. Luke's Hospital in San Francisco. Uh, she was a floor supervisor by that time, and she'd heard about a really cute new intern who was making his rounds in obstetrics. Now, well, she got herself assigned to assist him. Well, when the time came for the actual delivery, there was some problem on our floor, and she didn't arrive at the delivery room just until the point where he was delivering the baby. So she got herself into position, looked down at him to indicate that she was ready to assist. He looked up. The only thing that he, she could see of his face above his surgical mask was his eyes. And they were a couple from that point forward until he passed away in 1967. So I come from a double background, uh, adventure and scholarship. And I think that's what, you know, what started me going. Now, one of the other qualities my ancestors had was taking pictures. They love to take pictures you know, of themselves. You see a, a, a photograph of a guy who sort of looks like Abraham Lincoln now? Yes. Okay. That's my great grandfather, George Mason Ford. Uh, this picture was taken in 1865 and I still have the original print. Wow. Now, let me ask uh, those of you who would like your descendants to remember what you look like. Uh, do you think you, your descendants are going to be able to access the cloud and uh, <laughs> store your images digitally 140 years from now? Well, who knows? Well, this is a picture of my grandfather, Frank Chase, holding the pet ocelot uh, that he brought back with him to California from the gold mines of Columbia. Well, this is uh, to indicate that I had a very early uh, interest in railroads. Actually, I was born with it because after my fa father got his MD, he took a job with the Southern Pacific Railroad in San Francisco at its hospital. So I started with trains very early. This is my first toy train. Uh, I was three years old, and this is Big Red. When my mother passed away, I discovered Big Red among her possessions. She'd evidently saved him after I grew up. You know, well, at that time, I was working on a son myself, and so Big Red had a new engineer. When he grew up, I saved him again, and now there's a third generation of Hepners pulling Big Red around the floor. I don't know. Well, uh, <clears throat> in this picture at the train station at Auburn, I'm saying goodbye to my father in 1943, who went away to serve for three years. Uh, so I didn't see my father for three years. Uh, my mother's brother uh, was serving on Tinian Island uh, and serviced the Enola Gay uh, because he was a radar mechanic. Uh, my father's brother, elder brother, was on a hospital ship in, in the Pacific. So I grew up from the age of three to six without any male influence. Now that's not unlike the situation today where kids don't have fathers around. 
The difference is that we called our missing fathers heroes. Because you're in the video there. Mm -hmm. Well, here's another picture of me when I was three years old with my first train book, Smokey the Lively Locomotive. I was three years old. Now, it might surprise you that I was reading a book like that, especially since the American Library Association says that that book is intended I don't know, Jim. in kindergarten and older. But I don't know. It should be awesome. Happening. Yeah, it should be awesome. Happening. Yeah, it yeah, I accidentally muted you, Frank. You're back. Okay, I'm back. Uh, uh, did you hear about uh, how difficult the book was? No. Oh. No, okay. This book is normally for kindergartners, but I was reading it when I was three years old. And the reason is because my parents taught me how to read. And that was normal for middle class kids, uh, was that they knew how to read already by the time they went into nursery school because their parents taught them. Now, the little girl sitting next to me, is Brittany. She is the daughter of our downstairs neighbor. And she is showing both intense disinterest in trains, because she's reading sp uh, the little engine that could, and me. Now, if I had known at the time what Brittany was going to look like when she got a little older, I think I may have, pay may have paid more attention to her instead of the camera. <laughs> That's Brittany when she was 15. Well, I followed a different path. I went the route of the nerd. Yeah. But it was easier, I think, on nerds in the old days uh, than it is for nerds today. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, when I got into high school and needed to have a date for a costume uh, party dance, no problem. Take a look at my engineer boots. Well, this is the first train picture I ever took. Uh, it's the uh, motive power for the coast daylight. It was taken outside Third and Townsend Station in San Francisco. I was 10 years old and I used a borrowed uh, camera from my mother. Uh, you can see it. Can you see a little car you know, off to the left side of the picture? Yeah. Okay, that's a Fraser, a long extinct brand. Well, as soon as I turned 16, uh, since I had a family railroad pass, I did something that would not be possible today. I started to play a game. The game was, as soon as 310 came along and I was let out of school, I took the family railroad pass, went down to the train station, got on the first train out, and the game was to get as far as I could go and still get back in time for class on Monday. Uh, well, on one memorable occasion, I got as far as El Paso, Texas, uh, and managed to get, uh, get back. Well, unfortunately, I didn't arrive back exactly on time for school on Monday, so I had to serve detention with all the other juvenile delinquents. Well, due to some family issues, I had to spend some time living with my grandparents in Auburn, 135 miles from San Francisco. My grandparents lived a couple of miles from the Southern Pacific track, and there was a little uh, rail yard nearby. And I used to uh, like to take uh, my camera. I was 13 years old by now and go down and take pictures of trains. I fell in love with this little locomotive. Well, one day I was coming back from a Boy Scout meeting, wearing my uniform, walking beside the tracks, and I heard Ch -ch 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 -ch. the little guy was coming along. But then I heard something unusual. Ch -ch -ch. He stopped. The engineer leaned out the window, said, hey kid, you want a ride? Well, I discovered something in that moment. Einstein was wrong. A physical body can move faster than the speed of light if it's properly motivated. So I dashed over. He hoisted me up into the cab and said, okay, kid, there's not much room here, so you're going to have to sit over there. And he pointed to the throne of God, the engineer's seat. He said, I can't read the, reach the controls from here, so you're going to have to run the engine. Oh, my goodness. So for five miles, I ran the train, and then I figured I better get off, uh, and I ran home. Now, that would never happen today because of legal concerns. But that was what really started me on the path to rail fandom. Well, I went to high school and I took a photography course. And the photography course uh, changed my photographic world. I started taking pictures of athletes. And I discovered 
that I could make money doing this because I would take pictures of the jocks and they would buy prints from me to give to their girlfriends. So there, as a result, uh, by the time I was 16 years old, I owned my first Leica camera and I used them to take much better quality railroad pictures, including this one, which is my favorite. This is the coast daylight heading south you know, out of San Francisco. Now, Thomas Wolfe said, you can't go home again. And that's really true. Uh, I used to go to every part of the city taking pictures. Well, I recently went to, go uh, to um, Google Earth and, and I Googled this same spot. This is what it looks like today. And just so you can see, here are the two put together. It's just incredible. Well, I took my first international trip uh, in 1964. And uh, I'd outgrown my father's railroad pass, so I went cross country on the California Zephyr. And students didn't go to Europe by airplane those days. They took a, a, a ship. And I took the SS United States, which was and still is the world's fastest ocean liner. Now, one of the other points I like to make in these talks is how far the middle class has deteriorated economically. It costs $200 one way on the SS United States from the, uh, from the US to France. I still have the menu from the captain's dinner you know, on the last day. And this is in third class. On the captain's dinner, the third class was served caviar, pate de foie gras for appetizers. And you had a choice between roast prime rib or Del Monaco state for your main course. That's a little different than the flying economy today. Well, I arrived in uh, Switzerland for a three month tour of Europe. This is the Matterhorn and this is the Matterhorn uh, Bahn. Uh, fabulous, uh, fabulous trip. And I went through Austria uh, and steam was still very prevalent uh, in Europe at the time. And this is a, not, not that far after World War II. And the reason was very simple. Coal was cheap, oil was staggeringly expensive. So, so all our old coal, uh, burn, coal burning locomotives were in use. Now, some of you who are really sharp may notice something like, uh, nod your heads if you can see a little arrow. Can you see an arrow, my, my cursor? Yes? Yes? Okay, I don't know. All right, well anyway. Yes, yes we can see your cursor. Okay, thank you. You'll notice this is cl clearly a European tender, but it has American trucks. Oh, what is that? UNRRA. That stands for United Nations Recovery and Relief Administration. And this was a help organization that was designed to restore Europe, or at least the allied part of Europe, to the way it was before the war. And so the result was that we paid the United States about 90% of the cost of restoring the railroad system of Europe. So their train systems are tremendous today and ours are less so. Well, then I went to graduate school in Davis, California. Nod your head if you recognize this locomotive. Everybody know what this is? Yeah, yes, okay. This is an Alco PA. It's a passenger engine, and many people think it's the most beautiful diesel ever built. Well, Davis was a wonderful place to you know, take railroad pictures, and you could still take pictures of obsolete practices like train orders like this. Well, I was a bullshit artist by this time, and I managed to talk my way into getting a cab pass right in the cab of the super chief to Raton Pass. And I just discovered something. Railroad engineers don't wear striped caps. They wear pork pie hats like Popeye Doyle uh, in the French Connection. Well, I was unaware of the fact that these big diesel engines bounce like crazy. Uh, I, I thought they were gonna derail for a while, but it was a wonderful view. Well, it was time to move on to something else. So I moved up to Seattle to go to graduate school in 1967. And this was a great time to be a rail fan. Uh, the, uh, the Great Northern, the Northern Pacific, uh, uh, Union Pacific, all were running absolutely first class trains, but they were in the middle of a transition. So we often uh, saw what we called rainbow trains, different paint schemes in the same train. This was the Empire Builder. 
Well, there was a very large chap, an active chapter of the National Railway Historical Locomo and Locomotive Historical Society. They had their own private car and they would couple it behind unusual trains. Well, this was the Rish Wishram Local. It ran through the Deschutes River Canyon. It was what was called a mixed train, freight and a couple passenger cars. Now you can see there's an old coach up here and there's a combine. Now you could ride anywhere you wanted on this train. You want to ride in the cab, the, the engine, that was fine. But I went up to this combine car and I noticed there was something unusual. Suspended from the opening here, there was a huge naval destroyer searchlight suspended on cords. Next to it was a scabbard for a rifle. What was going on here? Well, this train operated mostly at night and these guys were mostly hunters. So when are they going to do their hunting? Well, they, they couldn't get out during the day. So what they did is they jack lighted deer you know, with, the, <laughs> with the rifle they kept here. So they would shoot a deer, stop the train, butcher the carcass and bring it back. Also got down uh, to the last stand of the Milwaukee Road's electrics. Uh, they, were, they were still operating into Eastern Washington by this time, but not into Seattle. Well, the, the railroads, the Northern Pacific and the Great Northern uh, bef before the merger were huge on uh, uh, public relations activities. So there are all kinds of uh, snow trains and other kinds of trains run for uh, kids. Well, then it was time for another trip across the Atlantic, this time on the brand new Queen Elizabeth II. I was on the maiden eastbound voyage from uh, New York uh, to La Havre. And about halfway through, does anybody recognize what the, uh, th that symbol means? Anybody know what that means, two balls? No? Okay, that means ship out of control. Halfway across the engine on her first voyage, her engines quit. And so she drifted for a couple of hours until they got it fixed. I'm sure that Cunard would love to pay me to remove this picture. Well, we then went to all over Europe. Uh, this is a picture, uh, one of my favorites, uh, of the crew waiting for orders to take off uh, in Ireland. Ireland was a great place and still is to take trains. This was the train depot in Cork. Then on to Switzerland again. And, and this was typical of the, uh, the viaducts uh, that the Swiss railways operated. They were built to look like Rome, uh, Roman aqueducts. I also got a chance to ride on a little uh, cog railroad, uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, bond. Now, when you looked at all the metal parts on this thing, they looked like they were stamped made by Rolex. This is our own equivalent, the little guy who goes up Mount Washington. And its metal parts look like they were stamped Joe's Auto Salvage. But it still works. Now here is one of the great train rides uh, that anybody who's interested in railway should take. This is a train that goes up to the Jungfrau Yacht. You can see it's a cog railroad. And from its base, it climbs up partly inside the mountain and it ends up at an altitude about here. And so you're above 11,000 feet. Great train ride. Now the object of this trip, now this is again the economy. I was a gourmet by this time. I was a cook and I loved good food. I wanted to have lunch at the best restaurant in the world on an assistant professor's income. Well, this was Le Pyramid in Vienne, France. It was on. It had a 12 course, absolutely world-class lunch, bottle of wine for $65. And that same meal today would be about $1,100. Assistant professors couldn't do that. Well, after that luxury meal, it was time to start my new job in Rhode Island. This was the Penn Central in the old days. Well, I'd spent my entire life on the West Coast. I was used to the Western trains and then came to Rhode Island and things were so dismal that I spent my first two years here trying to figure out a way to get out. But then I started going around a little bit and exploring and yeah, maybe it's not so bad. So I got down to New Haven uh, to see uh, what new stuff this new Amtrak was coming through. 
we all recognize uh, an old RDC. This one, I, my failing memory have, uh, doesn't tell me what this is, but this was an, an electric freight locomotive. Amtrak was desperate for motor power in those days, and they bought it from a mine, a coal mine operation, uh, I think in New Mexico. Then off on one side, here was this poor old E unit waiting for the scrapper. And I thought this was kind of a nice picture showing the old and the new. Well, speaking of old, uh, you could still see the classic Pennsylvania GG1 uh, coming into New Haven from time to time. And here, I, this, uh, if, if you're interested in motor power, I love this shot. This was a GG1 and a, an E, and you can get an idea of how big these things are by just looking at the size of the engineer. These are enormous machines. Here is a train, uh, I, I was going to say famous, but it's more likely infamous. It was United Aircraft's turbo train. Now, I wrote it a couple of times, and it never, as far as I know, it never acquired this name, but it was informally called the Vomit Comet because it had a pendular suspension, uh, just like the Acelas and many the Spanish trains do today. The problem was there were no shock absorbers. So if the train would swing out as it went on a curve, but then when the track straightened out, it would just rock back and forth. And so everybody was puking by the time the train got to New York. That's why it wasn't particularly popular with passengers. Well, back for another trip to Europe, this time with my mother. Uh, again, to show you uh, how economic times have changed, she'd never been to Europe. Uh, she was born in Korea, but she liked to travel. So I decided to take her on a trip, first class on the Queen Elizabeth. And we arrived in La Havre. This is where my uh, cover picture came from. And, and I was delighted to see that there are rail fans everywhere. Here's a little kid talking to the engineer. Well, we rode, uh, we, the end point of the trip was Rome, uh, and we rode on the new, relatively new Trans-Europe Expresses, which are beautiful trains, and this was our server in the dining car. My mother, who was a widow by this time, uh, was enormously atta attracted to Sergio, and I was afraid she was going to get off the train with him in, uh, in Florence, but I dragged her back. But we did go uh, on a side trip uh, to Switzerland, and this is the Reichenbach Falls, where Sherlock Holmes supposedly met his death. Well, in the late uh, 70s, I made my first trip around the world. I discovered something. People, there was a lot of money floating around academia at the time, and people would pay you to talk to them in distant places. So I got an invitation to give a talk in Hong Kong, and I, their expense, and I found out that for just a couple of hundred dollars more than the round trip Hong Kong to New York, I could get a round the world ticket. You can make seven stops uh, and go around the world. So I did. First stop was in Hong Kong. And the thing that any rail fan will instantly recognize was the double decker uh, streetcars uh, that were very, very common then. Well, I went off to India uh, to see the steam locomotives, and they were still plentiful. Uh, India at that time still had five foot gauge tracks. Uh, if you thought those tracks looked a little wide, you were right. Well, I figured as long as I was in New Delhi, I might as well go up to Nepal uh, and take a look at Mount Everest. Well, Royal Nepal Airlines uh, had this old, completely clapped out, you know, old converted freight airplane, a Hawker Siddeley, that they made into a sightseeing plane. So we got on board, took off. And I told the, the stewardess that I was a pilot and would it be okay if I went up to the cockpit and talked to the, to the captain? Uh, and she said, oh yeah, sure. This was before 9-11, obviously. So I went up, uh, introduced myself, uh, and the captain asked me, have you ever flown a hawker? And I said, oh, no, no, no. Well, oh, why don't you fly for a while? So I did, and I managed to get the shot of Mount Everest. Well, Continued on, and I gave a talk at Oxford. I was waiting for the train to take me back to London, and all of a sudden, out of the fog, comes this apparition. Now, you'll notice that people over here are not staring at it or looking at it or maintaining. This was normal. And I discovered that this was from the Royal 
uh, railway museum at York. And it was their practice to take all of their museum equipment out and at least once a year run it on the main line, you know, just to kind of exercise it and make sure everything worked. And so th this was the normal occasion. Well, after that trip, it was back to the United States. Uh, and uh, my trips inside the States were sort of boring, but probably not. I wanted to go down to see Horseshoe Curve uh, in Pennsylvania, very famous from Pennsylvania Railroad days. Uh, and, and justifiably so, still worth a trip. Uh, and these Penn Central locomotives were sort of on their last legs. Well, I got an invitation. I got a, a, an invitation to accept a Fulbright Fellowship to the Philippines uh, about a year or two later. I ex accepted, uh, and they told me that when I arrived at the airport in Manila, somebody from the hotel where Peace Corps volunteers stayed would meet me and take me there and get me started. Well, Manila it has the most chaotic airport in the world. I didn't know where the hell I was or where I was. So I finally got up my way out to the exit hall. And there was a guy that held a sign that said, Dr. Hepner. This was the guy. And so I went over to him and he said, you are Dr. Hepner? I said, yes, come with me. And so what was I gonna do? I followed him out. Uh, and he had a whole beat up car out in the departure area. So I got in, we drove around for a while until I was totally lost. Then I pulled over to one side and leaned over his seat. You know, I was sitting in the back seat and said, what kind of girl would you like tonight? I said, what? Uh, what kind of girl would you like tonight? Blonde, brunette, redhead? Maybe a dwarf? No, 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 I, no thanks, no thanks, no thanks. Ah, know what you mean, you get tired. How about a boy? No, 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 no. Hash from the mountain province? Great grass. I turned down everything. So he looked, stared at me and he said, you were the first one of my American customers who hasn't wanted at least one of my services. In that case, would you like to come home with me tonight and have dinner with my family? Well, I did. And that started a year long friendship and we went into the mango business together. Well, the Philippines was not a great place for railroad interest, but it opened my eyes to a lot of things. The Philippines had been one of our strongest allies during World War II, but we did not give them any aid at the end of the war. We gave them their independence and we left our old Jeeps there. So being very resourceful, they made them into buses that they called jeepneys, 15 passenger jeepneys. Well, I don't know any Jeep that ever carried as few as 15 people. This is the normal method of transportation in rural areas. But if you got in the big, in the way beyond, this became public transportation. People would ride logging trucks. Now you'll see, with the, here's a guy who's got a carbine with him. Uh, the Fulbright Foundation sent him along with me because I was going into one of the active combat areas. Well, there were railroads uh, on the Philippines. Uh, this is a now defunct railway, railway uh, called the Panay Railway. And these were uh, war surplus Japanese locomotives that had been left there. And they did have one passenger train, the Panay Local. Uh, it was home built you know, from leftover everything. It had a marine diesel engine and a truck transmission. The only train in the world uh, that I was ever familiar with where the engineer had to shift gears. Well, it didn't have brakes. So it didn't stop at any of the intermediate stops. You had to jump on. And this is one of the reasons why when you got on the train, you didn't change cars. Well, my beloved assistant who found everything for me, found out I was interested in trains and found this for me. This was a still working Heinkel sugarcane engine and it burned sugarcane from the sugar fields. Beautiful. Well, a couple more trips, now, one to Japan and this I'm sure you recognize was one, is one of the Shinkansen trains. Now here's something, uh, when you travel, it exposes you to cultural differences. You know, okay, you, I, you're, you're happy to be an American, always like to know about other places. Well, these Shinkansen trains could hold 1500 people and they could empty and reload in about a minute. Can you imagine getting 1500 people off a, a, a regional? on and off, how did they do it? Well, you see their lines painted here, and there's a number. 
Well, as the train was coming into the depot, everybody who was getting off at this stop got all their bags and stood in the aisle facing the front exit. All right, everybody's standing there. So when the train stops, car 12 door is right opposite this point. The door is open and the people who are getting off go out the front door of the car and the people who are getting on get on the back door of the car. So it's just a constant motion. So there's this enormous crowd for one minute as people are getting off and on train leaves. Now, could we do that? No, we're cowboys. We would never do anything like that. And that's fine. Because we built that railroad for them. Well, Japanese, when translated into English, often has some rather odd syntax. I have no idea what it means to feel coke. Well, a couple of other trips, I uh, wanted to ride uh, the a very famous line in England. Uh, that goes to the Isle of Skye. Uh, you take a little ferry boat over there uh, to one of the best Scotch distilleries in the world. Uh, you can go up to Wales and they have a lot of these little, uh, little former slate railroad uh, engines and trains. They're wonderful. Well, back to the United States again. And then my life changed. I married in 1990 uh, to a very unusual woman. Uh, she had been a forensic psychologist, uh, and at a Tascadero State Hospital in California, she played chess with Edmund Kemper, uh, who was known as the co-ed killer. He went around with the heads of his victims in, his, uh, in the trunk of his car. She also looked like a fashion model. Well, we decided for our honeymoon to go to Europe, and we decided to go from Switzerland to Morocco by train. Okay. Well, Switzerland uh, to France is on the, the Tagevays. These were new at the time. And then you have to go through Spain to get to Gibraltar. And there was a brand new luxury train in there called the Antelouse Express. And our, our travel agent booked it for us on a positioning move so that there were only eight people on this 18 car train. We are scheduled to leave uh, at uh, 10 o'clock at night. The chef de train came in and asked us if we would like to speak to the chef de cuisine. The chef came in and asked us what we would like for dinner and he would shop for us. And so we got the meal of our choice. This is like having dinner with Audrey Hepburn. And eventually found our way down to Morocco. And I took this picture because this was such a romantic idea, the train to Casablanca. Well, Morocco had a very modern uh, railway system, much to my surprise. This is an international GE engine. It looks like an American engine, but you know, notice it's got buffers. The reason that Morocco is so successful is that it uh, controls most of the potash in that part of the world. Now potash, uh, some of you may be familiar with it, can be used either for fertilizer or gunpowder. So war or peace, they do okay. Well, we took a side trip after a couple of years. We went uh, down to New Mexico for uh, a while and we had to stop by Elvis's place. And here was a sentiment that most people didn't agree with. And New Mexico is where the first atomic bomb was set off. And so here you have one of the products of that, a mutant mouse. Well, you can't escape the bomb in New Mexico. Once a year, they open up the Trinity site where the first bomb was exploded and they truck down a bomb casing uh, from one of the original atomic bombs from the museum in Los Alamos. And this was a very, one of the more, most peculiar experiences in my life because you went close to this thing and this wasn't a, a, you know, a mock-up or a lady. This was one of the bombs, the shells, that was going to be filled with an atomic bomb if the Japanese hadn't surrendered. And as you approached it, it radiated evil. It just felt like an evil, you could sense it, everybody could sense it. And so, but everybody, for some reason, had to go up and had to touch it to see what it felt like. So I was kind of happy to get out of there. Well, New Mexico is so big that you have to drive to the middle of nowhere to get some place of uh, railroad interest. 
Uh, and uh, sure enough, they have a middle of nowhere bar. All over New Mexico, you can see uh, mining and railroad uh, relics. This was the great copper mine, the Santa Rita copper mine. Uh, the reason the shot's blurred is because I grabbed it out my window as I was driving away. This mountain in the back is the tailings from 300 miles or 300 years of copper mining at this site. Incredible place. It's also the place to see mainline railroading. Uh, you get down into the southern part and they have both the Santa Fe and the old Southern Pacific main lines. And any of you who are fa uh, fans of the Southern Pacific, there is one, uh, will recognize a very unusual object. It's a colon tower. This is the only place in the entire Southern Pacific system where they use coal burning locomotives. Otherwise, just a beautiful thing. Well, I got another Fulbright uh, to go to Borneo. So this time, uh, it was the US. Uh, these are the trains in Hong Kong, where all the people live in Hong Kong. This is where they live in places like this. And this is the train that went to the mainland. This is the famous ferry, the most famous ferry in the world, I guess, uh, going to Hong Kong Island. And uh, here's a picture in Borneo, in the, king, uh, the kingdom of, of Brunei. Uh, I was there to assist Elton of Brunei set up a new university. Uh, well, since the richest man in the world at the time, uh, they abandoned all of their logging efforts. You could still see some evidence of the logging railroads. How did I get this picture? This is Salt of Brunei. I made friends with a guy who ran the local camera shop and had a photo service, and I signed on as his assistant. Now, if the royals had ever found this picture, I would have been expelled from the country with the speed of light because you may not take a picture of the Sultan in an undignified pose. Well, there was evidence of railroading around. Uh, this was an long railroad locomotive in the southern part of the country. We did a lot of visiting. Uh, these were former uh, headhunters, uh, and their souvenirs were lashed to the ceiling. We were a little nervous about being there, uh, and this was before the tourist raid started. We were visitors, not tourists. Well, we went up to the uh, up to Thailand and, and had a kind of an unusual experience. The year before we were there, they had banned elephants from the logging industry. So all of a sudden, there were 3,500 unemployed elephants uh, in Thailand. And what are they going to do with them? Well, they decided to put them in the tourist industry. Well, they, well, they didn't know exactly how that was going to work. Uh, so they figured, well, maybe tourists would like to ride an elephant. Uh, so you had to start off, and there was a guide who sat up here. Uh, and we were about halfway through the trip, and he motioned to give me, uh, for him, me to give him my camera, which he did. He gave me back the camera, and then he ran off into the woods. So there was me and her on an elephant. So I said, okay, go elephant. And the thing took off like a bat out of hell. It had rehearsed, yeah, it was a rehearsal. I had no idea those guys could run that fast. We went through rivers back. We eventually doubled back to the you know, recovery area. Went to another place uh, where I learned that you have to be very careful what, what you say yes to. Uh, a monk came up to me and said something in Malay. I understood a little bit, but I knew that you always said yes if somebody makes a request. So I said, sure. So he, what he said is, how would you like me to hang some deadly vipers over your shoulders? OK. So I'm here, so they didn't bite me. I did get to go see some uh, some trains in the northern part of Borneo. Uh, there was uh, essentially what was a logging and commuter railroad. And here you could see why the, the forests were disappearing. Uh, they could just simply make so much more money by cutting these logs down than by leaving them in place. Uh, that when you, now it, it's really sickening to me when I look at uh, Google Earth pictures uh, of Borneo, you think that, this is all gone. So we were, we were one of the last people to be able to see the real native forest. Uh, this is a train going to Burma, and it just had crossed the bridge over the River Kwai, which looks nothing like the bridge in the movies. Well, it came back, and then it was time for more mundane railroading. One of the great loop trips of all times is to take the Canadian across country, across the, uh, North America, and then come back uh, the northern route through American railroads. 
you know, well, the Canadian has been a fabulous train you know, for 50 years. And it's still great as far as I understand. Uh, we came back on the Great Northern uh, and in Glacier National Park, you can take one of these buses from the 30s that have been rebuilt with propane engines by Ford. They're called Red Jammers. And one of the things you can do is visit uh, the Prince of Wales Hotel, one of the greatest places in the world to have tea. Well, there are shorter trips that you can take. Uh, until very recently, uh, it was possible to get, uh, take a short ride on a private car. Uh, these things normally cost hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars, but for you know 50 bucks, you can take it. Uh, you could take it from Providence to New York. Amtrak has changed the rules recently, and it's in limbo as to whether or not you can still do this. But if, if it comes back, that's a great thing to do. Well. I learned how to be a bullshit artist when I was a kid, uh, and I, that property has continued with me. I managed to talk a guy into getting a cab ride uh, in uh, one of the Amtrak's locomotives going into Boston. And I'll tell you, that is one of the most surrealistic experiences that, that you will ever have. Uh, because as you get close to Boston, uh, the train dives down into what seems like a canyon. Uh, and you go through this thing at a high speed, and it feels like, uh, uh, just like Star Wars. It's just like, it's amazing, it's incredible. Well, I also managed to talk my way into the cab of the Mazella. And surprisingly, the cab of the Acela bounces like hell, it bounces all over the place. But it did give me a chance to see a view that most people don't ever see, and that is a view through the Hellgate Bridge. Well, in recent years, uh, our trips have gotten a little bit more sedate. This is one of the great train rides of the world. If you ever have an opportunity, this is the Flan train in Norway. And the train starts down here, winds around this way, and then goes through a canyon, kind of in back of this mountain, and it ends up at this altitude after four miles. And it's a standard gauge cog railroad. Now, the only problem with it today, as with all tourist attractions, is they're too popular. Uh, millions uh, of unruly uh, people, but, you know, that's the price you pay. And this is the locomotive, probably the most powerful cog engine in the world, an 8,000 horsepower electric, electric standard gauge cog engine uh, that is used mostly on this land line. Well, I had to take a trip uh, to Slovenia at one point, uh, and uh, there they uh, sponsor street art on their uh, commuter trains. It's kind of unusual. Well, you know, I, I've traveled half a million miles by rail, and I still wonder what is there about train riding that is so emotionally attractive? Little kids start out. You know, they, the first thing they do when they see a train is they will pull up their camera and they want to take a picture. And this is, this is a very common experience for people. Now, here's a girl waiting for something, probably waiting for somebody. It's not like an airport where you can't see them come in or there's these giant crowds around. You can see the train. And it's a, just a dot on the horizon and it gets closer and closer and closer. And as the train gets closer, your anticipation grows about what is going to be on that train, what is going to be so wonderful. And this is what's going to be so wonderful. That's a railroad experience that you can't get any place in the world. So, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention. This has been a real pleasure. And if you have any questions now and you'd like to unmute, go ahead. So, I'm done. Thank you. Questions, you can either ask them or just uh, do them in the uh, uh, chat. I'm going to shut down your uh, uh, screen sharing, Frank, now. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. There. Good. There we go. There we are. All right. Where uh, was your last trip? Uh, the last, I think the last trip was probably our Norway trip. Uh, okay. I've, I've a few by myself, but. Uh, 
uh, last year or so has been tough for a variety of reasons, so we haven't made any long, long trips. Yeah. We did We did take, uh, I guess, about five or six years ago, uh, another Europe trip uh, that uh, went down through Italy, and, uh, and that was great. Uh, train travel is still is still wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. I recommend it heartily. It's a different experience. Uh, the experience change. In some cases. <clears throat> On the um, on the elect on those electric engines that, that they run down around New Haven and stuff, was was it uh, New Haven that came up with those first? Uh, yeah, th those those pictures of the early electric uh, electrics, the GG one and so forth. Yeah, that was at New Haven. Yeah, because they came up with one that looked like a box on wheels. Remember that far back? Uh. They had an electric engine that, that the engine was right in the middle and it looked like a box on wheels. Yeah, I don't I don't remember that, but you know, my yeah. this is Lady, come here. Coaching. Toaster engines. I remember those. Oh, oh. You, yes, there you go. Come here. Yeah, they used to call them toaster engines. I knew somebody was gonna know it. Oh wait a minute, no. <laughs> uh, the toaster engines, I forget what they they were the the next generation before the current generation of electrics on the car. Right. Yeah. Toaster. They yeah. still use them oh, as switching oh, 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 engines here or there. Right. They were something 13 or what was, what were the, what was their official name? AM7s. Yeah. AM, yeah. Yeah. I remember those. Oh, yeah. Sure. Because they, they came out before the GG1s. Yeah. Uh, AM7s yeah. were long after the GG1s. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The engine you're talking about was called the brick. Everybody with, uh, thing in the middle. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I never heard them called bricks. Toaster was the name that I always heard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and then, but, but generally one of the, the uh, least attractive locomotives around. Well, the the current generation, which I guess is being phased out, uh, Amtrak wanted the. Uh, whoops. Something happened. Oops. Uh -oh. There's the toaster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. There, yeah, there's the toaster. Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, the, the, the next generation, uh, I think Amtrak wanted to call them sprinters. Yes. You know, but they, there was another perfect name for them. Lynx. If you looked at the front end, they looked like a, a lynx cat. And they had slanty eyes and careful expression. It would have been a wonderful name for them. But Hey, Frank. Yes. Uh, Bob Peters. I have to honestly tell you, those are the best pictures of trains that I have ever seen. Your composition was very interesting. Uh, where you went and what you did was just amazing. And I really, really enjoyed it. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I'll put in a little bit of a sales pitch. These pictures are all from my, my book, uh, The 70 Year Train Ride, and it's available on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Very really? good. I think it's only $13.95, folks. Come on, come on, give me a hand here. Frank, I gotta tell you, I bought your first copy off of Amazon. Wonderful. <laughs> I remember when you posted on Facebook, I said, oh, that's me. <laughs> Well, hey Frank, Frank, yeah. when you were talking about the Philippines, I knew I knew you weren't lying, be because I've been I've been there. I've seen it in action. Oh, okay. I, I I actually got married there. Mm. Yeah, they don't have shotgun weddings. Oh, yeah, they use yeah, 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 yeah. They don't have they don't have shotgun weddings. They have machetes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for putting this this up. As you can see, it's thirteen ninety five, which is dirt cheap. Uh, I, I, uh, the, the first book that, uh, that I published was in 1990, and the publishing industry has changed so dramatically, mo mostly just in the last few years, uh, and, that almost everybody self-publishes now. And th this was a self-published book. I couldn't get a publisher interested in publishing this book, so I did it myself. Uh, and 
there are about a million self-published books that can't come out every year, which is one of the reasons why it's, it's so hard to get a market for them, because it's just, you're drowned in stuff. There aren't that many train books that are out, but if you, if you have a, a, a romance novel, a bodice ripper, as they call them, uh, there's plenty of those. They, there are about 200,000 romance novels that are published every year. It's, it's breathtaking. So, any other questions? Well, with all with all your books, with all your book sales now, maybe you can buy Pan Am. They're up for sale. <laughs> all my book sales, yeah. You know how much I make on every book. <laughs> my battery. Huh? <laughs> it's not that much. <laughs> So uh, I, I publish these things uh, because it, it's fun to work on them. And uh, you like to share stuff. Uh, so uh, I, I know a lot of people have been to these places and this will bring back some memories for them if they didn't take pictures themselves. And that's why I do it. I hope people have fun. Yep, it did bring back a lot of memories. Oh, hope so. <laughs> Okay. I, used to, I, used, I used to work with an engineer when you was mentioned about the steam locomotives and stuff. And, and my engineer that I worked with when I started railroading, as I said, how is it in the steam engines? He said, in the summertime, it's hot as hell. In the wintertime, you'd freeze. <laughs> well, I gotta tell you, sorry. This is my aging memory. I've forgotten his name. But the engineer, who uh, was uh, on that uh, train going into Boston. Right. The only guy, yeah. as far as I know, qualified by Amtrak to right. operate uh, diesel, yeah. electric, and steam locomotives. Uh, and he worked as a volunteer on the val uh, Valley Railroad. Uh, okay. And when he passed away, I thought this was wonderful. Now, his daughter uh, commissioned a funeral train for him. And all of his friends gathered together. And there's one place you know, when the, the steam train is coming back towards Essex, it has to climb a little grade. It has mm -hmm. to move hard. Uh, well, she took his ashes. Uh, they stopped at the bottom of the grade. And all of his children went up to the cab of the engine. And when the engine was working full steam going up, they opened the firebox door and the ashes. Uh, and so all right. ashes went out all over the Connecticut River uh, from the steam engines that he got. So I, I, everybody was that close. Wonderful. Yeah, that, that, was, that was a nice deal. Cool. That was a good deal. Wow. Very interesting. Oh, thank you. A anything else? Thank you, Frank. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay.